Hi, it's Kernatex here, and this video is going to be all about installing Linux from scratch 9 on Ubuntu with the addition of uh, System D installation and hopefully EFI installation 2. Now, um, originally my plans were to do a set of videos for the updated Linux from scratch, as I say it's version 9 has been released today on the 2nd of September 2019 um, but I wanted to do something slightly different and in my previous videos I sort of recommended that you stick with the distribution as my suggestion was a Gen 2 live DVD as it had all the tools on there and it, it's a pretty safe environment to install Linux from scratch from especially if you've never done it before um, I kind of wondered how the other distributions are, which I've used in the past, how they are these days for using as a host. And then um, I think I had a comment on my channel saying that you can you know, more or less use any uh, distribution would do. So I thought, well, let's go back and try out Ubuntu, see what it's like. And um, unfortunately... I have to report that it's still not quite as straightforward as uh, using something like Gen 2. Um, there's a few caveats, so I thought I'd go ahead and do a recording using Ubuntu and just point out ways around the little problems that I encountered, which is the kind of problem, problems I used to encounter when um, I was first getting into Linux from scratch, um, which, well, Ubuntu didn't exist back then. Um, but there was other distributions I was using where I was having similar sort of problems. So I'll sort of be showing two, I suppose you could say two techniques to, to get around issues um, for the requirements for installing Linux from scratch. So that's, that's one thing that's a little bit different about this video. The other thing that's a little bit different is just a week or so ago, um, Somebody also commented on the channel about doing a demo for System D and uh, using UEFI for booting. Well, System D is something I've never done. I've I've contemplated it, um, and to be quite honest, it seems to be such a divided camp about whether SysV in it or System D is the way to go. I've always stuck with System System V in it. But yeah, I thought it's a good chance for me to have a go at it and see what it, see what it's all about. So that's another uh, thing that's going to be a little bit different. Um, and then finally, the UEFI or EFI uh, boot sequence, rather than using the BIOS boot sequence. Um, although I've uh, installed Gen 2, I think on one one of my machines using EFI. Um, it's quite straightforward on Gen 2. If, if you've used Gen 2 or if you follow my videos, um, a lot of the nitty gritty stuff is taken care of. You just you know need to know where you want to install stuff and so on. So in Linux from scratch, as it's more hands-on, it was quite a lot more involved. I I'd found a hint on how to install it, but that was quite old. It was a couple of years old, and that was based on something that was even older from 2014, I think it was. So it's like five years ago. Um, and those instructions I was having problems with because the software's been updated, the tool chain's been updated. So the, the versions of software that are mentioned in that hint weren't working. The modern ones weren't working for whatever reason. Um, and I was almost going to give up with it, and I found a, a more recent version of the hint uh, from April last year and I did actually manage to get the machine booting using um, EFI without any BIOS at all um, but I've come to look at it again today and it's, it seems to have lost the settings like the um, the information about the um, Linux from scratch seems to have just been forgotten about in the um, configuration of the UEFI, UEFI so I'm not quite sure because I've done it on the uh, virtual box I'm not quite sure if it's an issue to do with that where it's not retaining stuff or if it's something else some other command I need to run to actually cause it to remember 
the uh, systems that are installed so unfortunately I haven't got the uh, a spare machine to try this on or spare disc or anything um, at the moment so I don't like I said I don't really know if it is an issue with the installation that I've done or with the virtual box but I'll go through it anyway um, in case it is just an issue with virtual box um, we'll see how I go so that's the three things basically we're going to do install Linux from scratch and, and what I'll do with Linux from scratch because I've um, installed it previously on 8.4 in a bit more detail and I've also done my recent or almost completed uh, 486 Linux from scratch on 486 videos which are individual videos per package I'm not going to do any commentary on the actual installation it'll just be the configuration basically but the actual chapter 5 and chapter 6 parts I'll just um, I'll keep recording I'll just install them without any commentary and then there'll be co so there'll be commentary for the beginning where I'm configuring the system setting up for the installation and I'll do commentary right at the very end where I'm doing the um, EFI part sort of uh, try to muddle my way through that again um, um, we'll see how it goes so what another thing I'm going to do is so I haven't really got a system to install this on as a EFI system. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show how to get Ubuntu up and running partly on a a, a virtual machine just to show you what needs to be done there to get it going. And then I'm actually going to boot it on a, a spare machine I've got and then SSH into that and then I'm going to show that being done purely because it's got eight cores it'll be a remote machine so the recorder won't slow the machine down as well because part of the issues I've had before is the recorder recording sessions seems to slow the um, slow the compilation times down quite a lot not only will VirtualBox only allow me half the number of cores I've got available on the machine I'm recording on um, the, the recorder seems to slow the machine down as well so by compiling on another machine that's got eight cores and it's quite a recent machine as well I think it's a six series i7 so it's quite fast it's got lots of memory as well um, by doing that I'll, it allows me to record to do the recording of the compilation in a lot, lot less time it'll be you know a few hours rather than you know a day or whatever it was before so hopefully that kind of makes sense but it'll, it'll allow me to demonstrate the, the key parts of this so it's it's less about Linux from scratch 9 um, although I will like I say be recording that but it's more about using a different host system one that's a little bit awkward which we've got to tinker around with to get it into a state that Linux from scratch can be installed on and um, I'll be running the tests as well just to prove that you know there well I'll be running the test at least on the tool chain because that's the important part I think I might miss out on the rest of it but we'll see in the test that um, it compiles up really, really well. There's um, the tests that fail are just the ones that are mentioned in the book when I was doing testing. So it gives you a lot of confidence that although it's a bit awkward, the the bodges and the workarounds to get get the host system into a state that's fit for compiling with Linux from scratch um, are, are good workarounds, are good fixes. So. Um, and then, of course, like, like I say, the other parts are the system D, which I've never done before, which was a request also, and the EFI part. So I shall start now. Um, I'll start by showing um, the Ubuntu. Well, there's the web page, the main web page, Ubuntu.com, and the image that I downloaded. Just click on download, and currently it's the latest one, 1904. Um, there will be an update. They do new versions of Ubuntu every April and every October, so um, there will be a, an update in another month or so to 19.10. Um, I tried the 18.04 long-term release, but I thought, well, what the heck, let's go for the latest one. So if you just click on that button there, it should automatically start downloading, and there it is, it's prompting me. So I'm not going to download that because I've already got the image ready for the um, virtual virtual machine. So I'll just cancel that. And optionally, it's probably a good idea if you follow these instructions on how to um, verify that the download is is um, 
complete and not corrupt or missing or anything. So, so that's where to get the image from. And then obviously, if you're on a real machine, you'll you'll want to burn that to a DVD. It's two gigabytes, as I remember, the download. Um, so it gives you all that information there. So as I say, I've got a um, virtual machine here. It's it's just a machine with a CD drive, and there's no hard disk because I just want to show you how I'm going to set up the. This is what I would be doing on my remote machine, but because I can't screen record that, I'm showing it to you here. And then the next bit will me will be me uh, connecting into that remote machine on on the machine I'm recording on now. So let's boot this off. Okay, so there's a menu there, try it without installing, so I'll just accept that. Just want to use the live DVD part. So I'm not really au fait with Ubuntu. I find it very confusing, the, the package managers. There seem to be several. I don't know if they're related or if they're links or not. There's one called Apps, there's one called Apps Get, and there's another one called um, Snap, I think it is, I've seen, um, when it's suggested to install packages. So it's nice that it suggests you how to install them, but it's a bit confusing where you've got these different, apparently different package managers. I don't know why. Um, uh, I mean, when I've used it, I quite like it, but things like that just niggle me <laughs> so I've never really stuck with it so let's see if we can make this a bit bigger uh, display settings uh, oh, I'm not sure why this hasn't gone completely full screen but hopefully that's big enough. <clears throat> okay, so there's the desktop that's um, appeared. So the first thing I need to make a note of is the IP address that I've picked up. So I'll be doing this on my remote machine because obviously it's going to be different. But what I need to do is if I go to term, first of all, I'll change the password of the root. Uh, sorry, sudo, I need to do sudo on that. So I'm just going to change it to something to remember, then I'm going to become root permanently. So the first thing I need to do is I have config and this fails, but it tells me that I can install this package with apps installing it at all. So I'm going to do that. Okay, it's installed, so I can do I have config now. Again, and I can see that okay, yeah, there's the IP address now. It's a 10.0 number because I'm in a virtual box, but um, and it's using DHCP. But on my when I boot this onto the real machine, I'll be getting something different. So, but this is just to demonstrate what you would do if, you, if you're following these instructions, what to do to um, if, if you wanted to. Um, access the machine remotely. So the next thing I need to do is to um, start an SSH server. So there's no SSH server by default. Um, so it needs to be installed with what I've got here in notes apps get. I don't know why this is different but this is what I used when I was testing this. Type in apps get installed open SSH server. So it asks us if we want to continue, yes. Okay, and then we want to start the server. So forward slash etc init.d forward slash now it's just SSH and start, not SSHD, which it is normally. So that started the service, and now I've got enough to access remote, remotely this machine, or what will be this machine with eight cores, um, and I'll be able to 
do the compiling a lot faster. So what I should do now is close this video down and go and get the other machine prepared and then come back and carry on from, from the remote terminal. Okay, so here we are on the remote machine. Um, I've got a browser up here with the Linux from scratch web page, which I'll just get up now. And we're going to read it online and the current stable, which should be version 9. <clears throat> so I'm going to turn that into the uh, remote machine, which I showed you how to set up earlier. The Ubuntu machine. With the IP address I've got from that machine. Never been into this before. And there we are, we're inside it. Now there's one, well, a couple of things I didn't show you. One thing actually, um, should have done before Telnet uh, SSH in, is the etc sshd config file needs to be modified to allow root logins. This line here needs to be added to this config file, and then once you've done that you just need to restart the sshd server which is done with that command at etc init d ssh restart um, and then you'll be able to log in remotely okay if, if you are logging in if you're like um, if you're doing the uh, build on the same machine you booted from then you can ignore all this SSH stuff. I'm only doing it just to make the video recording easier. Okay so let's jump straight into the host requirements. Um, that link there. So we've got this script here to run that they've provided which checks all the software and checks the versions of it so let's run that in straight away okay and straight away it's failed see there's this little pause between all these commands because it's loading programs off the DVD <coughs> but you can see the first test it's made there's an error bin sh does not point to bash so let's fix that first of all. Um, let's try where is uh, dash. It should be in. Yeah, it's oh, it's in user bin. Okay, so where is sh? That should be. Oh, that's in user bin as well. That's not what I expected. I thought it would be here. Unless it's symlinks. Uh, okay, that is there. Okay, looks like there's two copies of it. So let's look at the path. It looks like user bin is scanned before bin is. So I'd say it's probably the user bin one that we need to modify. Um, oh. All right, bin is a symlink to user bin, so that's why. It's um, there is only one copy, so it doesn't matter where we, where we, whether we do that changes in bin or user bin, the ref changes will be reflected in the other directory. Okay, so I'm in bin, so what I'm going to do here is look at sh, and you can see sh is a symlink to dash, so we need to change that because that's what the uh, problem is it says here bin sh should be a symbolic or hard link to bash which it isn't so what we should do is we'll do another link command 
um, that's SFE, so that's create a sim link, force it, that means overwrite the current link, and V just for being verbose. I'm going to link bash to SH. So that seems to have done that. So if we do ls l SH, you can see SH now points to bash. So if we now rerun the script, so you see there's no error now. It says bin SH points to user bin bash. So that's OK. So we can check the rest of this now. So bash the version number is OK. It's at least 3.2. We've got 5.0.3. Bin utils 2.2.5. We've got 2.3.2. Alright, oh, next thing is Bison is not found. So we need to install Bison. So we can do that with apt install Bison. Okay, so let's rerun the script. And there we go, Bison. We've got 3.3.2 and it needs 2.7, so that's okay. BZIP2. 104, we've got 106, that's okay. Core 6.9, we've got 8.30. Diff 2.8.1, we've got 3.7. Find utils 4.2.31, we've got 4.6, that's okay. Gork should be 4.0.1, we've got 4.2.1, and user bin orc should be a link to Gork. So user bin awk, yep, it points to gork, so that's okay. GCC 6.2, including the C++ compiler G++. So we've got GCC 8.3 and G++ 8.3, so that's fine. Then the glibc 2.1.1, we've got 2.29, so that's fine. Grab 251.a, oh, sorry, 25.1a. We've got 3.3, that's fine. Gzip 1.3.12, we've got 1.9, that's fine. Linux kernel 3.2, we've got version 5. M4, we need 1.4.10, we've got 1.4.18. Make is 4.0, we've got 4.2.1. Patch 2.5.4, we've got 2.7.6. Perl 5.8.8, we've got 5.28, so that's fine. Python, we need 3.4, we've got 3.7. Sed 4.1.5, we've got 4.7. Tar, we need 1.22, we've got 1.30. Then text info 4.7, we haven't got. Um, XZ 5.0.0, we've got 5.2.4, and the compilation is okay. So, the only remaining problem we've got is make info. Now, I had some issues getting hold of this. Um, I tried to do it because the make info is part of text info. Um, I tried installing that with apt install text info and it suggests that it's not available, it's referred to by another package so it might mean the package is missing or it's been obsoleted or is only available from another source then it says however the following packages replace it so what I did next was to install all of these packages because I didn't know which one of them it would be and it says that info is already in the newest version it's already installed but it's been set to manually installed and install info is already at the newest version. So it looks like these these two packages here, install info and info, are already installed. So it just leaves text info doc non free to be installed. So we'll install that. And if we rerun the script now, let's just put some space between that. You'll see. Despite the fact apparently it, we've installed text info, make info is still not found, so I then tried doing install make info in case that's a separate package. Uh, no, it's not. And even if you search on the Ubuntu website for the package, 
it appears to indicate that text info has got make info and if you install these packages it will appear and it just doesn't seem to and again this is what bugs me about the um, package manager it just seems to be a bit impossible to work with for me so in situations like this where I can't rather than waste time trying to get this to work what I do is I follow the instructions to install the missing packages from the LFS book so first thing we need to do is to get the package so if we go to all packages find text info I've got whole words on yet so there's the package so let's copy that link let's download it okay let's extract it and then what we'll do next is go to chapter 6 because that's the final installation where things are installed like normally if you like Go to text info and we'll just follow these instructions to compile it. You can see there's going to be a long pause while it checks for programs because they're all going to be loaded off the DVD, but in theory, once they're in memory, it shouldn't need to scan the disk as often unless, unless those uh, cached files get pushed out of memory. Okay, some warnings there. The disable static's fine. Um, that's not a problem. And some bits there about missing stuff from in curses. I'm hoping that won't be a problem for us. So let's just make this. I'm going to make some nine jobs. And I'm also going to check this just to make sure it did actually build a usable package. Okay, everything seems to work. There's no errors at the end. We just quickly scan through the summaries. Looks like everything's passed. Yeah, so that's that's built fine. So let's just install this. So this installs this LFS method of building text info into our Ubuntu system. Um, and I'd like better do this just in case that's needed. Well, that's done. So in theory that should be all we need. Um, I'll get rid of the package as well. So we'll just rerun that bash version check and you can see we've now got um, well we haven't got a make info error and it's actually reporting GNU text info version 6.6 .6 and it requires 4.7 so we're all good to go now with building the LFS system so let's just move ahead um, right now because we're going to be building with um, the, oh, that's a point. I think I'm on the wrong book, actually. Yep, I need to go back to the main web page. I need to be on the system D book. Um, never mind. Right, yeah, it should be in this one down here. So let's just rerun the host requirements just in case there's any differences here let's just quickly scan this, the version should be okay, I'm just worried if there's any additional programs that are required no, that looks 
pretty much the same as before, so that's okay. Okay, so this is a point where there's not so much a recipe of what to do here because it's it's down to your personal configuration and requirements. Um, I think this is a bit that gets people a little bit stuck if you've not dealt with partitioning before. So I had to do a bit of research on this myself because we're building a, um, a full EFI system with System D and what I did find out that um, what you can do when you're building EFI is you can create a small partition for a BIOS boot so although it looks like you're booting with EFI it's kind of a bit of a um, bit of a bodge um, so basically the partitions would be same as we'd build normally a separate boot a main root file system and a swap file system um, but if you do need to or you do want to create the um, system with the BIOS partition then quite welcome to do so but I won't be doing that here I'll be doing a full EFI um, system so because it's EFI it's not enough to use um, FDISC because it's not capable of creating a GPT partition disk although having said that I believe I believe the latest versions are capable of doing that but just to be sure it's probably best not to use it and unless you're absolutely sure of course um, so I'm going to be using Parted um, which is capable and has been for a while of creating GPT configured um, disks so start off with Parted I want to say optimal and the device name. Um, now you are probably going to be using SDA I imagine or SDB. I'm actually using a ZFS um, volume uh, so where you see me typing in ZD0 um, that, that's where you'd be putting in ZDA. The, the only reason I'm using Z, this ZFS is because uh, this system I'm using I've, I've got to make sure I don't make any changes to the system so it's a little bit of protection for myself um, so let's get into that. So we've got the parted prompt up here, and we can do print to see what's on there. And you can see it's a 16 gigabyte drive, 512 byte logical sectors with 8K physical sectors. As I say, it's a sort of a, bit of a kind of a virtual device actually which is why it's got such large physical sectors um, so the first thing we'll do is we tell or, or write a signature a label they call it to the disk to say we're using the GPT partitioning scheme rather than normal MS-DOS one so if we do print now you can see that the partition table previously was unknown and now we've set it to GPT Next thing we want to do is tell it that we're going to be using megabyte units. So you can see that's changed the uh, display of the sizes. We've gone from um, decimal gigabytes to binary megabytes. Uh, so that's the actual size of the disk itself. So the first thing we can do now is um, make a partition with the command make part primary and we'll start at 1 and we want this to be 128 megabytes so we go all the way up to 129 so we skip the first bit which is why we start at 1 and 1 minus uh, 1 from 129 to 128 so that should be our um, 128 megabyte partition and then it's, it's giving it the default name primary. It starts at the one megabyte boundary, finishes at 128 megabyte boundary, and it's exactly 128 megabytes. So now we'll give that a name just so we know what we're going to use that partition for. And we'll do that with name, partition number one, and the 
name we want to give the partition. So now if we print, you can see that that name has changed from primary to boot. So let's create a swap partition now. So MK part primary uh, start at 129 and we've got 641. That should create a 512 or a half gigabyte partition. Yep, so there you go, 512 megabyte. And again, we want to name this so we know what we're going to use it for. So I call it swap. And if we do print, you can see that um, it's changed it to swap. And finally, we'll create a partition for the root file system. So we'll call this with MK part again, primary. And we want to go from 641, which is the end of the previous partition. This time we put minus one in. That means create the partition all the way to the end of the disk. Don't care how big it is, just use up the rest of the disk. So now if we do print, you can see the rest of the disk. What's left is approximately 14 and a half gigabytes. <coughs> so let's just set the name of this partition. Call that root FS for example. Okay, now there's a couple of flags we need to set just to indicate that some of these partitions are a little bit special. Um, if you're using the BIOS partition, you'd need to set a BIOS underscore grub flag, um, but as we're not using that, we, we don't need to do that flag. But we do need to, for the EFI to understand that there's a partition it can use and read, we need to set a boot flag um, onto the boot partition. So this boot flag doesn't actually mean this partition is bootable, it's just a flag to indicate to EFI that it, there's EFI related information on that partition that it can use and examine and so on. So to do that we do set the partition number one because that's what the boot partitions on, the name of the flag which is boot and we put on to show that we want it turned on. So if we now do print you can see it's added that boot flag and conveniently it's also added another flag ESP to show that it's the EFI system partition on, on that partition. So that's quite important the fact that that ESP is there for the EFI system. Okay, so that's all done in Partet, so we can quit now. Uh, we can ignore this bit about updating into CFS tab because this disk is only going to be used within our new LFS system and we'll be creating the um, FS tab inside there later on. So now we need to format this partition. Um, as I said, if it's a separate ESP partition, it should be. Uh, VFAT type, um, 32 bit VPAT, VFAT type, uh, and that would leave us to format the boot how we want to. But being the boot and the ESP are a combined partition, then it's recommended that we just format the whole lot as um, VFAT. So to do that, we do MKFS dot FAT. We use the minus capital F flag to show that we want the 32 bit fat not the 16 bit fat and it's on dev set the uh, partition one what's the point now that listed yep, p1 yep So again, because I'm using this uh, block device, it's going to be slightly different. So in your case, it would be SDA1, because um, it's basically a loopback device, which is why it's got the P in the in the name to show that that's the partition number. Um, so I didn't want that, did I? I wanted to do MKFS uh, 
dot fat minus f thirty two slash dev slash z d zero p one. Okay, so that's created that first partition with a um, v fat file system. Then we'll do mk swap on the second partition, which is our swap drive. And last of all, on the mkfs dot x4 is the part is the file system type we're using on slash dev slash cd zero p3. Okay, so that's done. So we've done this bit here in the book, so we can carry on. Let's create the LFS variable. And this is something we're going to be doing a few times, just checking that it's set, because it can cause problems if you forget to set it, or we've um, rebooted or changed user and it's not set, it will cause problems. It does suggest that um, could add it to the bash profile, but being as we're on a, a live CD that's kind of a bit pointless because if we do reboot, it's going to get lost anyway. Okay, so let's create the LFS directory that we're going to work in. Let's create it fine. And there it's saying there's a command to mount our. FS partition. So again, for you it will be SDA3 for example, but for me it's going to be ZD0P3. Oh, ZD0, not ZDO0. Okay, so that's worked. Um, and then I need to, as it suggests here, if there's multiple partitions, you need to do extra stuff. So for example, we might want to do something like this to create a boot drive, a boot partition, or a boot mount point rather. And then we mount the first partition at the boot. And that's VFAT, is it? I think the partition type. And then turn the swap hot, the swap drive on. So that's ZD zero P two for me, and that's worked. So we can see we've got our swap partition mounted, and you can see there. Ignore all this. This is just to do with the um, live DVD. But this is our main disk, 15 gigabytes. So you can see we've got, sorry, let's do DF. Um, you can see we've got the main root file system, which is the third partition. And then we've got our boot, which is our grub and EFI partition mounted on the boot mount point. So we're all good to go. Um, Yeah, that should be ready to start the build. So let's create a sources directory. Change permissions. And let's actually go into there now. Uh, NFS sources. I'm just going to move the bash scripts we created early on into here. And then I'm going to get these two lists. So this is a list of the files that we're going to download. And this is a list of the checksums that we're going to verify the download afterwards. 
So let's run this command to get the packages and then we can verify them afterwards. Okay, so that's finished downloading. So we just run these commands to um, check the checksums, and everything looks okay. So I'll we'll carry on with the setup for the installation. Create an LFS group and an LFS user to do the chapter five installation. Give 
ownership on the tools directory and sources directory to the LFS user and become the LFS user and then we just make a few changes to the configuration for the LFS user now one thing I will add in here is I'm going to edit SRC and just add in another export for parallel compilation source those changes make them active so should have make flags set now yep and indeed there's a hint there about uh, parallel compiling okay so at this point I'm going to carry on compiling as I said before I won't do any commentary for this part or chapter 6 but I will resume doing commentary um, for the final um, configuration of the EFI system.